Hey guys, it's Chris, and we're back with something else, Amiga. What do you got today? I received a small box with just a couple things in it to repair. This comes to us from one of my followers, who I'm going to go by his username, Fluxotine. So this is all of his stuff. He sent me a nice note and some other goodies to take a look at. Upgrade, fix, and repair. Very good job in packaging. Included stuff. Mega 2000 mainboard, all chips populated with a 68,000 CPU and his 3.2 ROM, etc. A keyboard for the Mega 2000 has some uh, issues. A 2091 SCSI control with RAM and a hard drive with 6.6 .6 ROMs. A GVP SCSI board with two sticks of RAM and a 413 ROM. I'm going to be busy. Pi Storm and a 2000 riser board with a Pi 3A, 256 gig memory card, a shattered Amiga OS 3.2 ROM chip, and a multi-boot board with a broken fourth pin. 2000 main board needs a battery. Uh, recap, F1 fuse or more. Mouse isn't messing, isn't working. Please check. Amiga 2000 keyboard, the space bar is having issues. 2091 ROM upgrade and DMA fix if it needs it. I don't have any ROMs for it. 4.13, we'll take a peek, or 6.6, .6, I think 7 is the latest. If they're erasable, I'll erase them and we'll reflash them. GVP board, uh, what are the odds of a CPU, FPU, MMU, RAM upgrade? What can be done with these? I don't have that level of parts and the repairs that I do for free don't include CPUs and stuff like that. I can do caps and whatever I have that's not mainstream that I have, I don't mind helping. Uh, the Amiga OS 3.2 is screwed up because it cracked. Needs a ROM replacement. Uh, Pi Storm fails the buff test. It actually did boot to a workbench, but DH1 was not coming up and just power cycling every couple minutes. On the multi-boot board, the fourth pin on one side has broken off. Question, where'd you get your optical Amiga mouse? All his mice are male. The ones with the ball. And uh, obviously crap. Can we add one to the total cost? The total cost for me is nothing. I just do this for helping people out. So we'll see how far we get on this. Uh, where did I get my Amiga mouse? I got it from Amiga Kit. And you can get yours from Amiga Kit store. Um, depending on the stock, you know, it comes and goes. There is a global shortage of pretty much everything. So luckily I have a whole room full of crap that I've had for 30 years. And if I need custom chips, at least for the OCS, ECS machines, in the 500, 2000-ish line, I have many broken boards way back in the day from when we were supposed to RMA them back to Commodore. And they've been sitting in totes for 30 years. Lists. I have two pages of lists here. I'm going to put back in the bag of stuff here. I don't know what this is. What is this? This is a game. Munch them dots, gobble them ghost. Footman. I thought this was a record. <laughs> There's a game called Footman. Requires Kickstart 1.2 for the Amiga personal computer. Isn't that cool? Pretty neat. We'll check that out. Oh, there's a note in here. Oh, there's a receipt in here. $8. In 1989, he paid for this game. That's probably like $50 in today's, in today's uh, 2022 money. And that neat Footman. It looks like a Pac-Man clone. Considering the ghost and the dude in yellow and the dots. Very cool indeed. So we're place that back in the bag. Inside of here is going to be the Pi Storm and his boards and the multi-boot board and the ROM selector is what it... This is a triple ROM board. You can have three ROM boards, but as you can see, she broke the machine pins right off. Um, yeah, that's a long socket is what that is. Those are SIL turn pins that are really long. I'll see how long I have. Um, I don't know if they're going to be that tall, but I think I can get them pretty close. We'll test it. This video is most likely going to be a multi-part video due to the amount of stuff that I have to repair. In case you're wondering, this is the new uh, flip-flop. This is a flip-flop, Rob. You just kind of lean it down so you can inspect your chip. I don't know what happened to this thing, but this is freaking toast. Now, is it actually toast? Not really, because see this? This is just the glass. This might be able to be saved. 
But isn't that cool? That's what your ROM looks like on the inside. The big dip 40 is just for the lines and the circuits. We'll make a new ROM on the UV erasables like I have. And we'll get that fixed. So this is a legit Kickstart 3.2. I don't know who the retailer was, but we'll, re we'll be fixing that. I was blind, but now I can see because I bought a 7000 L uh, lumen light that's right above me now. So now I have three of them. One over here above the Amiga 1000 and one over here above my bench and one over there above the other Amigas. So we're good to go on light now. The reason I have such an issue is A, I'm old, B, I'm blind, I wear glasses, and you know, I can't always see the best. But I put on these Coke bottles so I can see close up. Normally I just have regular glasses that I can walk and do life things with, and that's useless information. But, that's what's going on. Boy, I got a bunch of stuff to do. So this is the, the riser, it looks like a kipper. Who made this one? You do. Arana. Arana Net. This is his uh, 2000 um, board for 68,000. You can put a vampire on here, whatever you want. Right now it's got the, the uh, Pi Storm. I would love to see what CPLD is on it. It has a QC pass on top of it. Interesting. Uh, we're going to be taking that and looking at it. There's also some flux on here. Good solder job, you do, Arana. Very good solder job. You even got the four pin power on here. That's great too. So okay, that's the Pi Storm on the riser card. That completes the list of stuff in the bag. Now for the box. Packaging is taking up my entire basement. Okay, so this is a lot of stuff to do. Normally my repair turnarounds are pretty quick. But with this level of stuff to do, it might take me a few days. And we have a snowstorm coming. My prison bracelet fell off. Okay, so after removing the 8,000 packages, this is a GVP. I think it's an Impact 030 because it had, I had the exact same board a long time ago. It has the two, to the, the the Amiga 2000 CPU slot with the top and bottom screws, DB25 out. You have the weirdo goofy 63 pin GVP RAM. This one has two on board. You have an internal 50 pin SCSI ribbon, your normal circuitry, Underneath of this lid should be a 60 to 30 at 25, and if it is the impact, it will have a 6881 or a 6882. So this one pops off real easy, and inside, I really cannot read this. Let's see. This is a 60 to 30 at 40. My bad. That is a replacement chip. Black. And a 6882. FPU. You got a 40 megahertz clock chip, which I do have 802,000 of those in stock because I ordered way too many. So there's our GVP board. I actually have this exact same board without an FPU uh, except minus 25. Pretty neat. And they've been using the uh, AMD mock chips for the controllers for a long, long time. So that's going to be a ROM and a health check after we even get to the board. This is a 2091 with a hard drive. I'm not gonna open this because of the hard drive. This is the Amiga 2000 keyboard. It's a little crusty, of course. Every keyboard is. The cable is in very good condition. A lot of times they get stretched right here because they get pulled. You can recover those. Um, this is a Cherry MX keyboard, so these are the these are the Cherry keyboards. This is the older Rev keyboard, unlike the 6.2s and newer. All right, finally, the meat and potatoes, the heart of the beast. Please don't yell at me, this is not mine. It's still in there. But, you're not gonna believe this. There's only a tiny drip of leakage and it's headed downward. Look at that. It's only one little bloop and it's going that way. So we're going to get that out. It has had three or four caps replaced, possibly in its life. So before we go through anything, this is going to need a capacitor replacement. This is going to need a new F1 fuse because I can tell you right now that sucker is popped. They don't, they're not supposed to bulge at the end. They're supposed to look like this, like F5 here. 
for the 12 volt on the floppy. It's 286336, it's NTSC. That means J102 is going to have a blob of solder for your 1 meg Agnes, aka the fat lady. I am going to be using a modern power supply when I test this. So for my own reference in the future, when I forget, I'm going to move J300 one tick to the right. So if this doesn't work, when you get it home, move that back because I tend to forget that. Uh, we'll go through all the fuses. We're going to check out everything. We're going to start on this board and get it working. I am going to do an initial test of this board as is. We're going to fire it up as is. We're going to use the Amiga Native Video DB23 with a 68000, nothing in it, the 3.2 ROM, just to see what we get. We're using the HDMI upscaler from you know where and that is going to shoot this to this Dell U2410F monitor. So this is the Amiga 2000 ATX power supply converter I purchased from Amiga Kit a long time ago. And what it does, you've seen it in the past, this has a button which is basically grounding out the load on a switching power supply to enable it to turn on. This plugs into your 20 pin connector, not the 24, you slide off the 4, boop, this gives you your normal uh, Amiga motherboard out. And it does tell you on the board that you should take J300 to 2 and 3 to internally generate the tick signal. All it does is gives us the ability to click a button here, and then we're just going to hit the button. The TV came on, the, TV, the monitor came on, and we're going to wait and see what we get. We should be getting the 3.2 ROM, so this Amiga 2000 is functional. Hooking up my external GoTech, 3.2 ROM should detect this drive in a second, and boot ATK. At which time I'm going to need the big toe. It's my Amiga 4000 mouse from Amiga Technologies. I call it the big toe because it's a big toe. This has an issue where it's not working. So, yep, we're not working. Nothing. Not a nada. To test my theory on the mouse, we're going to get the... Now this is my troubleshooting steps. This is not necessarily everyone's way of doing this. This is just my way. 5 volts on one side, no volts on the other. You see that? So Pico fuse is popped by having voltage at F1, you got 5 volts. Can you see that on the multimeter? I don't know. Maybe. Possibly. There's 5 volts. Okay. If I move to the bottom side of that Pico fuse, if I wiggle real hard, I can get 0 point, nope, and then it dies. If I push on the fuse, see that? I'm getting intermittent through it, 0 0.87, and then it dies. So something's happening inside this fuse where it's trying to let current go. But that current is just not getting there. And what that's doing is that's the 5 volts that the mouse needs to power itself with, and you get nothing. Turning it on again, the, the Cherry MX keyboard. This is an early Amiga 2000 keyboard. You'll know it's early because it'll have a red caps light versus a green. We're going to go to memory, test all RAM, one mega chip as you can see, random fill, ATK, <laughs> standard, just troubleshooting stuff, and it passes just fine. The spacebar is stuck down. I'm going to test CIAs, that's F7, and we're going to test timers. CIAs are okay. So, all in all, this Amiga 2000 is a functioning 3.2 1 meg unit with an original, like a Rev4 era red uh, cherry keyboard. Kickstart 3.2, 1 meg Agnes, 68000, all is good. My next step in this endeavor is to clean this board, recap it, refuse it, and go from there. I'm going to start with the refuse first, removing the shielding ever so carefully because it's never been off. Except assessing the battery damage from the VARTA or the GP underneath and going from there. All the screws are going into a bag so I don't lose them. Lift this up and wiggle. This is very good. This is very good to see. Why? Why is it very good? 
because there's no damage. There's one piece of a little bit of rust there. And that, my friends, is awesome. So that's in the box right now. This is the plastic cover I'm talking about. This protects the case from being grounded out. There's also two, one or two, plastic round circular things that are underneath. This is also in very good condition. No issues there. This battery is 30 something years old. Let's see what we get. It still holds current. Look at that. 30 years old. This battery is still good folks. It's leaky but it's still freaking good. Isn't that crazy? And it actually has more voltage, and that's probably why it's going on. It's a 3.6 volt battery with 3.91 volts. So, for everyone that bitches about a Varda and bitches about a GP, name another battery in nickel cadmium barrel that lasts 30 years. Great. Yes, do they do damage? Of course they do. But, why do they do damage? Because they are neglected and they're sitting in a computer for 30 plus years with no activity or little activity and they uh, they just start leaking because that's the nature of the battery. Alright, so here we go. We're heated up 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, GP battery right here. I'm going to show you how I remove a battery. A lot of people solder suck them out. I grab the battery, just touch and pull and I oscillate back and forth and once you heat the solder up, you can just wiggle it out and there it is. There's a battery, not leaking. Look at that. I cannot believe this. I cannot believe that. Incredible. That is still a good battery. It has seeped a little bit. There's some seepage here. But, you know, not bad at all. These are Q-tips I get from the dollar store because I go through so many. So I'm just going to IPA this. Now normally I hit this with a neutralizer, which I will do. I'm just trying to get an initial assessment. This is like nothing. Nothing. I think it's a marker. That is a black marker. That is not leakage. Incredible. Isn't that great? I mean, no damage to the board. No damage to the socket. CPU riser. It's just dusty. Now, I don't have a tank that big to stick it in the ultrasonic. It's a pet peeve that there's a marker mark on here. I'm gonna soak this and I might even hit it with a tad bit of acetone to break up the marker. I don't like marker where the battery is because it looks like a leak. Next up for me is the F1 fuse. Which one F1 fuse. Everyone asks why do you use liquid flux? I use Kester 186. It's a no clean uh, but I clean it. Flux, it's just better than that pasty crap because it just flows very well. Clean the holes and then clean the holes. That'll fix the mouse and we can even test that when we're done. Luckily these fuses are still being produced. They're slow blow. They're $1.99. There's the poke a hole in the top of the case. Reach in and grab one and just pull it out. Now they can fold your cardboard back over and the whole pack doesn't shoot out on you. Reinsert our fuse, our new fuse, into the hole. Pull a leg out to the side so it holds it, and then just blop it on in. Boop. And that's a fuse. We can test continuity between that fuse if we wanted to, because why not? This meter is plastic, so there's no worries. You can sit it on electronics. Continuity has been restored, so that fixes the mouse, should fix the mouse. We're going to test that right now after I trim these legs off and throw them right on the floor so I can step on them in a bit. That is battery removal. We're going to put a 2032 cell in it. Here we go. I ordered these from Amiga Kit. They were not that expensive and they came with the batteries ready to go. So while I'm in here, 
I am going to use one of Amiga Kit's diode blocking. It's got a diode in there that blocks the back charge here. The GP and the Varda, as you may have known, or, or may not, file this one in the old brain bucket there. And put it in the back. Uh, the Amiga recharged the, the Varda and GP. They're a rechargeable NICAD, nickel cadmium, and uh, that's a good battery actually from the, you know, 80s when these were out. But now we do these. So I found our, our leak with the Varda. The only leak with the Varda, or the GP, was on the ground. A little bit of crust and schmutz. You saw it leak here to here. This has been neutralized with a little bit of lemon from the refrigerator upstairs. Yes, lemon is an acid, but it's a mild acid, and it stops the other acid from being acid. And then I neutralized the whole mofo with the Walmart Equate 91 IPA. So I'm going to take the old fiberglass pen here, clean up the vias. Fiberglass pens can restore your vias to new. This goes in like this. Ta-da! I kind of like spray painting a car. You got a big cavity to fill. Don't go in there with 800 gallons of solder. Just give her a touch. Let the flow do the job. And there you go. We're going to trim the legs to give her a uh, proper fit. As you can see, the battery is in. It's level. And it's, uh, it's good. So our battery's in 3.46 volts. All right, here we go. No keyboard. With F1 replaced, we should have a mouse. Let's test it. Okay, flash floppy. I mean, a test kit is loading the Go Tekken, and it should pop up in a second. Maybe. Okay, perfect. All right, do we have a mouse? Let's let's find out. Let's. Uh... Bingo. Memory. We are back, Mortimer. F1 mouse is fixed. CIAs, precision timers, all good to go. So that's two for two. Let's go back to the uh, battery backup clock. Clock is detected, 1978. We're going to set the date and time to... Cool. 11.52. Cool. Cool. Turning the unit off. By the power source, not the switch. Turn the unit back on. We'll let it load again to Amiga Test Kit, and that way we'll test the clock and see if it's holding time. Chipset battery and clock, battery backed up clock, Sunday, January 16th, 11.52, and the time is ticking. So 11.52, you know what? I am so stupid, I could have just looked at Omnibot and saw the time. Caps are gonna be next, that's gonna take two and a half hours. I'm not going to bore you with a cap job. How about that? I'm just going to go Hua Chu and it's going to be clean and magically delicious. Hi, two hours 45 minutes later. Board's totally been recapped. Clean dish, you know, between uh, cleaning off flux, IPA and all this stuff. Here's all the goodies up here in the uh, pile O stuff. Yeah. No major problems, no trace lifts, no nothing. Everything came out good, even though I can't stand the solder Commodore used. Yeah, it's pure lead and probably from scraped off of the Titanic. And it takes an extreme amount of heat just to get it loosening up. So I usually give it a touch with some flux, my Kester, and uh, dab some new silver solder on there just to get some flow and then you can remove safely. I don't recommend doing like the solder sucking on here because what's going to happen is most people are going to go get either a Heiko FS301 or FR301, whatever, FS, FR, and the, or the knockoffs like I have, which come with too large of tips. So what do you do? You have a large hole, or a, a stick, you have a large hole that's going over, and you end up running the tool around to try to get the solder to melt off of the peg and you end up gouging the board or breaking the via. That's what I 
have come to terms with over the years of doing this. Let the tool do the work, let the heat melt the solder, and then hit the button if you're going to use that method. And that's fine for devices that you pre-treat and do all that tin work too, but when you have to go through all of these and, and you know, find where they're at, and I still have some flux to clean up, it's a lot of work. So I prefer the heat braid. Take your time, remove slowly, and you have no problems. So these are all um, Hitachi caps and Rubicon. That's all I had available. And I have a couple of the FZs, I think. A um, couple decent caps. No junk. I need to take a break. I've had the helmet of Goober on for over two hours. I look like Bubble. Bubbles? Yeah, Bubbles from Trailer Park Boy. Hey. So, I need to let this cool down also. Warped the tip. Got the old erectile dysfunction here. Excessive heat for almost three hours can do that to something. So, in a few moments of your time, I'm going to uh, acquire some poultry products and we're going to check back in just a second.